The lunar module, that spidery craft wrapped in gold foil, was far more than its fragile appearance suggested. Beneath its thin metal skin and shimmering insulation lived a dense electrical network made from thousands of individual conductors and circuit lines. These lines were the spacecraft's nervous system, carrying power, data, guidance signals, thermal readings, radar returns, and life support information through a structure where every ounce, every inch, and every connector had been argued over by engineers. The lunar module, both its ascent stage and descent stage, depended on these circuits for every moment of its flight. Without this invisible electrical anatomy, the engines wouldn't respond, the computer wouldn't think, the astronauts wouldn't breathe, and the spacecraft wouldn't come home. The wiring of the lunar module was dictated by physics and engineering reality. The entire spacecraft ran on a 28-volt direct current system fed primarily by silver-zinc primary batteries. These batteries could deliver high current, but only for a limited time, which meant the wiring had to be efficient and incredibly lightweight. Engineers were forced to use wire gauges far thinner than those found in commercial aircraft. Much of the lunar module used wiring in the 20 to 26 AWG range, with insulation so thin that protective routing became its own engineering discipline. These wires carried signals from dozens of systems, environmental control units, the landing radar, the rendezvous radar, the Apollo guidance computer, the abort guidance system, the attitude control jets, the engine controllers, the cabin displays, the caution warning lights, and the telemetry transmitters. The lunar module wasn't just a machine. Electrically, it behaved like two spacecraft bolted together. A lower descent stage that provided power and structural foundation, and an upper ascent stage that housed the crew cabin and the ascent engine. Their wiring systems overlapped, intertwined, and finally tore apart at liftoff. Inside the lunar module were miles of harnesses, each one hand-laced and tied with flat nylon cord in the old aircraft tradition. These harnesses formed thick bundles that sometimes ran along structural ribs and sometimes squeezed through gaps barely wider than a human hand. Technicians used aluminum support brackets called Adel clamps to anchor each harness. Because a vibrating wire in a spacecraft is a slow-moving failure mechanism. Unlike earlier spacecraft, the lunar module required large numbers of connectors circular mil-spec units with gold-plated pins to keep resistance low. The more connectors a system has, the more potential there is for a bad crimp, a bent pin, or a microfracture caused by thermal cycling. Engineers compensated with redundancy and strict quality control. Every crimp was checked under magnification. Every harness was given a detailed continuity test before installation. Once the insulation blankets were installed, large portions of the wiring system could no longer be reached. The spacecraft was designed to work perfectly the first time because opening it up again meant days of careful disassembly. The descent stage was the electrical bedrock of a lunar module. It housed four silver-zinc batteries, each roughly 400 amp-hours, feeding the lander's 28-volt buses. These batteries supplied the high current needed for landing, powering systems like the descent engine throttle control, the pulse-modulated attitude jets, the guidance computer, 
and the cabin life support fans. Power was routed through a pair of lightweight main buses, engineered to minimize resistive loss while keeping mass low. These buses were arranged so that a single failure could not silently kill the spacecraft. If one bus went down, the astronauts could manually tie the remaining power sources together, routing current through alternate pathways. Because of the low voltage, current could be high under peak loads. Some lines could momentarily draw 20 to 30 amps, especially during engine valve shifts or radar activity. For that reason, high current feeds used larger gauge wires, sometimes 14 to 16 AWG, with thicker insulation. The descent stage wiring also carried telemetry through small transducers scattered throughout the structure. Pressure, temperature, propellant quantity, and engine chamber data all traveled upward into the cabin along thin instrumentation lines, many of them in twisted pairs to reduce interference. The ascent stage had its own electrical personality. It carried two smaller silver-zinc batteries, enough to power the ascent engine's ignition circuitry, the guidance computer, the rendezvous radar, and the environmental systems during the return to lunar orbit. Before liftoff, the ascent stage depended heavily on the descent stage's electrical supply, connected through multiple umbilical bundles packed with wires. These bundles contained explosive separation devices. When the astronauts pressed the ascent engine ignition command, those devices fired and the bundles physically tore apart. The wiring had to be separated along pre-cut paths, with each conductor breaking cleanly to prevent partial shorts. Within a fraction of a second, the ascent stage's electrical world changed completely. It became electrically isolated, and its own buses and batteries took command. The wiring had to handle this transition without voltage spikes or noise bursts that might interfere with engine start logic or the guidance computer's boot sequence. At the heart of the ascent stage sat the Apollo guidance computer, built around custom integrated circuits that required clean, noise-free electrical inputs. The wiring harnesses feeding the computer were isolated from heavy loads, wrapped in braided shielding and routed away from the noisiest devices, such as motor controllers and heater lines. The AGC operated using discrete pulse signals and analog inputs from the inertial platform. Even slight electrical interference could distort its timing. Its data lines traveled in carefully twisted bundles, and each sensor line feeding the computer used shielding to prevent crosstalk. The Apollo guidance computer shared the cabin with the abort guidance system a smaller, analog-driven computer that used its own wiring routes and power feeds. The two systems were electrically cross-checked and their wiring was deliberately kept separate to avoid a single harness problem taking down both brains. The famous program alarms during Apollo 11's landing were not caused by wiring faults, but by a sensor generating more interrupts than expected the wiring had worked exactly as designed. The lunar module's cockpit contained more than 80 circuit breakers, and each breaker was wired into the spacecraft's electrical architecture through short, dedicated harnesses. These breakers controlled everything from radar power to cabin floodlights to the ascent engine arming circuit. Because the wiring gauge was extremely light, breakers offered essential protection against overcurrent situations. When Buzz Aldrin accidentally snapped the ascent engine breaker on Apollo 11, 
the wiring behind that breaker still held redundant command paths. The breaker fed a logic circuit rather than the engine directly. The felt tip pen improvised by Aldrin only completed a low current signaling path. The heavy engine ignition lines were already hardwired behind the scenes. Breakers were also used to remove loads during emergencies. If current draw spiked, astronauts could quickly isolate systems, lowering total consumption to protect the batteries and wiring. This feature saved the crew on Apollo 13 while they used the lunar module as a lifeboat. Every environmental reading inside the lunar module traveled through the wiring maze. The oxygen pressure transducers sent millivolt level signals along shielded lines. Suit loop flow sensors produced tiny analog outputs that had to be amplified and digitized. Temperature sensors distributed throughout the cabin, ascent stage and descent stage fed thermistor readings to the cabin instruments. The landing radar transmitted power at roughly 150 watts and required its own isolated wiring to prevent interference with guidance systems. Its return signal traveled in coaxial lines up to the computer. The rendezvous radar, operating at different frequencies and power levels, required similar shielding and separate routing to avoid mixing signals. To minimize electromagnetic interference, engineers used a combination of twisted pairs, foil shields, and braided copper sheaths. In especially sensitive areas, multiple shielding layers were used, with drain wires bonded to grounding studs located on the aluminum frame. The lunar module's structure was a patchwork of aluminum, mylar, kapton, and composite materials. It was not a consistent conductor. Engineers had to create deliberate grounding paths for the 28-volt DC system. They used flat copper bonding straps between panels, ensuring that electrical reference points stayed stable even as the spacecraft flexed with temperature. In vacuum, the wiring had no air to dissipate heat. Conductors had to be sized to prevent insulation from overheating, and bundles had to be spaced to avoid thermal buildup. Even small currents could heat a thin wire significantly in vacuum, so some lines were upsized specifically for thermal reasons, not electrical ones. Every connector and crimp had to endure extreme cold during lunar night and warm cabin temperatures during powered descent. Repeated testing demonstrated that temperature swings could loosen crimps if the wrong materials were used, so NASA required specific nickel-plated or gold-plated terminations for stability. The lunar module was designed with the expectation that small faults could happen. A sensor might drift. A wiring run might pick up interference. A breaker might trip. The astronauts could manually reconfigure the electrical system using buses, switches, breakers, and backup pathways. During Apollo 13, when the command module's fuel cells failed, the lunar module's electrical system suddenly had to power the lives of three people across an emergency return trajectory. Its wiring was never meant to run that long, at such low temperatures, under such heavy load. Yet the wiring performed with remarkable reliability, free of major anomalies, through the entire emergency. The spacecraft's nervous system survived conditions beyond anything it had been designed for. With all panels removed, the lunar module's interior resembles anatomy. 
Thick harnesses run like arteries. Thin signal lines trace the paths of neurons. Junction boxes behave like synaptic clusters, and power buses pulse with the heartbeat of the lander. This was a spacecraft that lived through its wiring. It breathed through pumps and fans, whose currents ran through those wires. It felt the world through sensors carrying millivolt-level signals. It thought through computers fed by clean, shielded pulses. And when the ascent engine ignited, its electrical lifeline snapped free, letting the upper spacecraft rise from the lower one like a butterfly breaking from its cocoon. The lunar module was not alive in the biological sense, but electrically, it behaved like a living organism. And it was this hidden wiring maze, the least glamorous part of the entire spacecraft, that allowed humanity to plant footprints on the moon and return safely home.